very good afternoon. Uh, at the onset, I think it's uh, an honor to be part of Sir's instruction course, and I thank him for giving me this opportunity. I'll be discussing uh, the pre-operative workup of a patient who is slated for multifocal toric and special situations uh, of the patient or the eye where we would be considering or not considering a multifocal. So overall, I'm going to give you an overview of the best clinical practices, which is basically from a review of scientific literature pertaining to the selection and use of multifocal intraocular eye wells, and in cases who opt for these eye wells and have astigmatism, the use of multifocal toric eye wells. Now, as has already been said, why multifocal toric? Because 30% of your cataract patients have astigmatism, and if these are the ones who ask for a multifocal lens, in order to give them the right effect of the multifocal lens, you must tackle the astigmatism also. As has been previously said, 64% of unsatisfactory visual outcomes following multifocal are due to residual emetropia or astigmatism. Okay? So when do we correct the astigmatism? A thumb rule is that in a multifocal patient, you should not leave astigmatism more than a quarter of a diopter. Preferably less, but if you are leaving more than a quarter of a diopter, that patient is not going to be happy. So first, when a patient walks in, what are the factors that we consider to give him the multifocal eye well option? Well, truthfully, I don't give the multifocal eye well option to the patient first. Most of the patients that have implanted multifocal eye wells have given me that option. They have come as motivated candidates for multifocal eye wells because they had friends who had multifocal eye wells or they've read about it. So they are, deep, they are deeply motivated. My intent is to demotivate them and if they still remain motivated, then we go in for the multifocal eye well. So it is very important to talk to the patient. You, I think when we start doing cataracts, well, you remember the name of the first 15, 20 patients that we operate. But I remember the name of all my multifocal patients. Because you've talked to them, you know their hobbies, you know their family. And in your conversation, you realize the kind of personality that the patient has. The first multifocal toric lady I did was very happy. And she wanted her husband to get a multifocal also. But I remember when I was taking her history, her husband was pointing out, you know, she developed an allergy to this and developed an allergy to that and she's sensitive. So he was a very type A personality. So that personality really comes out when you speak to the patient. And overall, you have to assess that the patient has to be relatively easygoing and is willing to make a small compromise of fine reading. The patient is still very willing to wear spectacles. And the patient is willing to partner with you like... Uh, Dr. Chawla has said, in the journey to, you know, get neuroadapted, tolerate certain visual phenomena and not make a fuss about it. Refractive patients are much, much more demanding than the uh, patients who already have a cataract because they're living with a disability. And myopes are always used to a good near end and they are often not as happy. Hyperopes are the best and happiest patients. So if you want to choose initial patients, hyperopes would be a great bet because they don't have good clear near vision, they don't have good distance vision. Um, I thought it was unfair to say, but they, um, it's very commonly said that multifocal lens is good for Indian housewives. It may sound like a sexist statement, but it's actually true. I think ladies of that age tend to drive less, and they um, you know, need some intermediate vision by kitchen work and other things, and they are ten tend to be more you know, less complaining. So they, are, they would be a good candidate again to start off with. All in all, however much you talk to a patient, this is a line which I think I'm going to ask here is, a multifocal patient does not tell you he's crazy until after the surgery. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, so after all the attempts of knowing the patient, you must also know the eye. The patient should grossly have a normal eye and optical system. A good macular function is a must. You may be missing subtle macular pathologies, so we do a free of cost OCT because you sometimes don't want to overburden the patient and end up with a normal OCT. For our record purposes, that the patient has a normal macula. Retinal diseases are largely a contraindication. So uh, the problems are really twofold. Retinal diseases may uh, compromise the vision and the contrast, and to compound that problem with a multifocal lens, the patient will not be happy. The second thing is, in case the patient needs a retinal procedure, there is a problem with visualization by the retinal people, so they are also pursued. So, um, 
The only patient where I really operated is one who had a very fine PRN. We had followed it on for six months and he had a multifocal in the other eye and he was insisting on that in this eye also. He did fairly well, but if it's the first eye and he has an ERM, especially if it's progressing, or he has any macular pathology, he has uh, developed a moderate NPDR, it is best to not do uh, multifocal in such patients. As we got optic nerve diseases, what is essentially um, the consensus is that if the abnormality is significant or progressive, a multifocal IL should not be considered. For example, you have a patient who is an optic disc suspect, he doesn't have glaucoma, maybe having a 0.7 disc, but has a normal fields, you can go for a multifocal. A patient is having high pressure, having no visual problem, he's just ocular hypertension and anti-glaucoma, again you can go for a multifocal. But a patient has progressively deteriorating fields on three anti-glaucoma medications, I would not want to go for a multifocal in such a patient. A one-eyed patient, ideally I would not want to go in for a multifocal because as we know that the additive effect of operating both eyes is what gives you the best vision and the lack of the compensation visual contribution of the second eye may lead to reduced contrast. So it, uh, one eye patients, if you review literature, it's only in very specific rare conditions after third consultation with their family that multifocals have been given. These have been given to patients who are generally in, inside the house taking care of themselves and because of a neurological or demen dementia problem, they don't want to wear spectacles. They lose their spectacles or they're not able to care for their spectacles. Uh, Amlyopia is a controversial topic because in an eye which is already compromised and a kind of a connection with the brain which is already compromised, you don't expect it to see perfectly or neuroadapt perfectly. So amnyopia uh, normally should, you should refrain from multifocal lenses. However, in anisometropic amnyopia specifically, the results are much better. So if you have to operate one eye and the patient's other eye is normal, this eye is anisometropic amnyopia, he's pre breast biopic, you may choose a multifocal. Uh, you must rule out squint again because, for example, the patient has an or he is fixating alternatively. Okay, he's an alternate diabetic squint, so he's basically using one eye at a time. So again, the binocularity and the compensatory effect of both eyes together will not be there. So he's not a good candidate for a multifocal lens. Now, once you've ruled out most of these problems and you've decided that my preliminary examination says that this patient may be a good candidate for a multifocal lens. What are the investigations or the more detailed things that you need to do? First of course, you need to take care of the astigmatism, which you will determine by the keratin tree. Second very important factor is the corneal aberrations. Third being the angle carpa and fourth being the pupil size. So when it comes to the corneal aberrations, you basically want to implant a multifocal lens in an optical system which is working quite well. If the cornea is highly aberrated, all the negative visual phenomena will be exaggerated and the patient will never be happy. So you have various methods of checking the corneal wavefront. The wavefront analysis that you do for refractive patients takes into account the wavefront of the entire eye as an optical system. But when a patient has a cataract, that part of the optical system obviously has aberrations, right? So you need to consider not the aberrations of the eye, but just the aberrations of the cornea, because the lens is something you'll be removing. So we had the eye trace with us for some time, and we um, did some patients on that. So this is the aberration of the entire eye. This is the aberration, sorry. This is the aberration of the entire eye. This is the entire eye, this is the lens, and this is the cornea. So as you can see, majority of the aberration in this eye is from the lens. Mm -hmm. So the cornea is relatively regular, there is no significant aberration. This patient would be a good candidate for a multifocal because you have a good optical system in terms of the cornea. Now, so here is a patient who, of course, you may do a topography and find irregularity there also, but if you're doing an aberration, you can see that the total aberrations of the eye, if you were to measure, they're quite less. But the lenticular aberrations and the corneal aberrations are quite high. In fact, the lenticular aberrations are actually compensating for some of the corneal aberrations. So when you put a multifocal lens and you have such an aberrated cornea, this patient is likely to be very unhappy. Angle carpa is increasingly getting to be a concern. There's not much that you can do about it. It's basically the angle between the visual axis and the pupillary axis. We normally do all our tests of centrations on the pupil. But 
that may not be the um, center in terms of the visual axis or the corneal light reflex. So if there is a large angle kappa, it's almost like having a decentered IOL, functionally decentered IOL. And as you all, all are aware, a decentered multifocal IOL is more likely to trouble a patient. So patients with large angle kappa may not be good candidates for a multifocal IOL. Pupil size again, if the pupil size is too large, it may lead to unwanted visual phenomena. And, a small, uh, and if uh, you have an eccentric pupil, particularly like coloboma, multifocal IOLs are absolutely contraindicated. So you need a regularly sized pupil in the center to take the patient up for a multifocal IOL. Now, uh, let's just so uh, take you through a video. We have the femtosecond laser system and that allows us to do a very good capsulotomy and which is really very important for patients with multifocal IOL. This is a patient who came to us for multifocal and had only about a diopter of a cylinder. In such a patient, we are not opting for a toric IOL because we have the um, luxury of doing an astigmatic with a femtosecond laser. So in this case, we'll be doing a rexis as well as an astigmatic keratotomy. So what we do here is we place the incision on the steep axis and we do an astigmatic keratotomy exactly 180 degrees opposite. You could also do paired LRIs. With LRIs, you're able to take care of about 1.5 diopters of astigmatism, but the effect is not as predictable as that of a toric IOL. So routinely for at least a diopter of an astigmatism, now we are preparing up the multifocal lens with a femto LRI. Right? This is a routine surgery and you'll be implanting a multifocal IOL. Now, I think I've covered this bit previously, but you decided the patient is for multifocal IOL, everything seems to be fine. Now you discovered that you do the keratometry of the patient. Often we do the keratometry after we diagnose the cataract. Ideally, when you do the ARK, you should keep that keratometry because the dilating drops will interfere with the ocular surface and may not give you that accurate uh, measurement of the anterior corneal surface. So you start measuring your astigmatism. This is one of the uh, tools most used by us as residents, but unfortunately least used when we start when we start private practice because we have other easier tools which the optometrist can do. But it is the gold standard for doing the keratometry, particularly while picking up a patient for tonic IOL. However, you can use any keratometry which works for you. And uh, you must make sure that you're using the same kind of tweeters so that if you're having errors in your toric, you can attribute it to a problem in the readings. And if you're doing torics from any reading, you don't even know what reading is correct. Right? If you have an unusual reading, you must make sure that you use multiple systems and try to collect whatever is the real crux and throw the garbage out. Right? So the IOL master in a survey has been shown to be the most commonly used thing, at least in the US, to do uh, IOL power calculations. But if you see this, the IOL master measures the keratometry at only six points. The newer version, they could increase the number of points. So if the steep axis lies anywhere in between these points, it will not be as accurately picked up. Right? So the IOL master, though works, um, it's not bad, but it's not the best for a toric calculation. Now, uh, you, when you are dealing with multifocal IOL, toric IOL, you must also take into account the astigmatism that you are likely to induce. Because you will have to create an incision, and when you create an incision, you will be creating a surgically induced astigmatism. A surgically induced astigmatism cannot be calculated simply by subtracting the pre-op K from the post-op K because it is a uh, thing that has a... Taking too much time. Uh, we need time for interactions and those... Okay, so actually I had 27 minutes in the schedule. So take time, we, because we finish at 3.30. Okay, so I think I skipped this bit. Uh, like I had said, I just find up in... Five minutes. Okay. So, I, like I mentioned, the posterior corneal curvature takes, uh, contributes to an astigmatism that is against the rule, and especially when you're doing multifocal torics, you would like to take that into account. Therefore, you may want to leave a relatively residual vulnerable astigmatism of the tune of 0.3 to 0.5. Now, uh, in order to mark the 
access, you normally make uh, a place you uh, mark it when the patient is sitting, and you can use a bubble marker, which is most commonly used. Right? Uh, this is a bubble marker. When the marker is held horizontally, the bubble will be in the center. You ask the patient to look at a distant object, and you mark the six o'clock meridian at least, and you can buy, uh, mark more meridian. When the patient lies down, you will correlate the six o'clock and see how much cyclotorsion has happened and then mark the axis at which the toric iron has to be implanted. Of course, there are times when you, when you drape the patient, the sister washes too vigorously and the mark is smudged and off. So uh, this is not the ideal marker and the way to do uh, possibly the cataract surgery of the future is to have a markerless way of putting a toric IOL. This is the Varion reference unit which helps you uh, which maps the, it has many more points than the IL master, so they say that keratometry is better. So you have to basically get all greens and uh, slowly move. Uh, it's a fairly time consuming thing. It has to be done undilated. The dilated ones, I've actually seen that the readings have varied from a point four astig, uh, astigmatism, and after dilatation, it's showing almost three diopters. So that could be a uh, variation. Could be due to the epithelial toxicity also. It will mark your steep axis, it will register the patient's vessels. Okay? And of course, you can use this to program your uh, toric IOLs because it has an inbuilt calculator and it gives you only Alcon actually because it's a product from Alcon. So, this is what the um, toric does. It, this green light, uh, this green circle is to be fixed onto the limbus and then the registration done. That means this is the right patient. So, even if you've you know, uh, it's the wrong patient will tell you that this is not the right patient. It will mark the steep axis. You will go in the steep axis and make the incision. It will also mark the paracentesis where you will go in and make the incision. It also gives you a circle which, which allows you to center and size your capsulotomy as precisely as you want. You could keep the circle centered upon the visual axis, the limbus, so that depending on how centered you want it, normally they recommend keeping the rexus centered as according to the limbus. So it's a limbus centered rexus and at the end of the surgery when you're putting an IOL, you will basically need to center it. So can you see where the, where the uh, where these two lines align, this is the center. So you want the IOL center to correspond to this. This is very important in a multifocal IOL because if the IOL is centered, you will have the best amount of, uh, you will have no rate centration and the least amount of visual uh, uh, disturbances, right? So just my last video, this is a patient of multifocal IOL, uh, multifocal toric IOL being taken up on the Varion. This is the axis along which the patient has to be uh, aligned. And you could use an irrigation on one side and another instrument to manipulate the toric iron into position. And then at the end of it, you see that it is aligned. Okay? After hydrating, you can again see because you have to A, remove all viscoelastic. So first you put the lens in the bag, align it, then wash it, and again put the overlay on and see that it's aligned and both centered. You can see that the crosshairs have to be in the central area. Right? This is a set. This is a video which shows the centration of the same. So you would dab it and get it a little in the center. This crosshair, the center has to be in the center of the eyewear in order to ensure centration. So I think I'll sum it up with that. Uh, thank you for your attention.